Well, Dr. Evelyn Chan is a pediatrician, consultant, and road scholar and entrepreneur with a passion for making healthcare patient-centered, sustainable, and equitable. Smiley Scope, where she's founder and CEO, reframes scary medical procedures using positive virtual reality technology. Hi, everyone. I'm David Williams, president of strategy consulting firm Health Business Group and host of the Health Biz Podcast, a weekly show where I interview top healthcare entrepreneurs about their lives and careers. If you like this episode, I really hope that you'll subscribe. Dr. Evelyn Chan, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Thanks so much for having me, David. Well, it's a real pleasure, and uh, your background is fascinating and impressive, as, as is your company. So they all go together, and I'm looking forward to uh, learning all about it today. Why don't we start back at the beginning? Love to hear like what your childhood was like and uh, any influences from early days that stick with you now. Yeah, so I grew up in Melbourne, Australia. You can probably hear from my accent. Uh, that's right. So a family, a migrant family, and they were really trying to establish a new life in, in Australia. So I grew up pretty much in the pharmacy. My dad um, had just created his own small business and was really just trying to make ends meet. Um, and so pretty much grew up there, learned how to count, learned how to serve people and be part of a community and understand that sort of initial healthcare experience through that. So that was really powerful for me, working hard, um, seeing my parents sort of work together and grow a business um, and then sort of see how community members really trusted them and asked them a lot of healthcare um, advice. And so that was something that got me interested in healthcare to start. My brother had autism as well, so that was another key early uh, childhood experience for me was how do I look after a younger sibling with uh, nonverbal autism and seeing how he and uh, my parents were navigating the health system, I sort of felt there had to be a better way to do this and make it a better, more personalised experience. So that really set the groundwork for my passion for healthcare, being able to, you know, I love the science of it and then also sort of bringing that art and personal experience into it. No, that sounds good. Well, you said I could tell from your accent that you grew up in Melbourne, but the truth is that I know a lot of people in South Africa and it always, I always had a hard time figuring out the difference between an Australian accent and a South African accent, which I know are different, but I felt a little better once I found out a few years later that these people that I knew in Australia were from South Africa originally. So no wonder I was confused as they moved <laughs> when they were adults. So anyway, so it's not, it's obvious that you're not from Boston. Let's just put it that way. From how you <laughs> that's, right. that's, that's about it. So then education wise, I, I saw a big impressive list, uh, you know, punctuated by Rhodes Scholarship somewhere in there. And I say you're actually active with the, uh, with the Rhodes Foundation after that. But what was your educational path after high school? So I went straight into medicine as an undergraduate. I was really passionate about pursuing healthcare. Um, and from there, uh, went into pediatrics training. And so had some really fascinating experiences. Absolutely love my time working with patients, but also wanted to see the bigger picture and how we could really translate, you know, all this research that had been done. How do we get that to the bedside as fast and as innovatively as possible? And so that led me to Oxford, um, where I studied medical anthropology and public health to really understand how could we kind of look at those nuances and challenges uh, to really try and overcome them uh, to have successful implementation in healthcare. How does the, I'm, I'm a somewhat familiar with the Rhodes Scholarship process, at least in the, uh, in the U.S. My, um, my faculty advisor uh, at Wesleyan was the North American secretary of the Rhodes Trust at the time, and he encouraged me to apply for Rhodes Scholarship, which I thought was he, he claimed to be serious that I might get one, but I, 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 I wasn't close, I don't think. But what was the process like for you? Did you know about it? Did you get recruited for it? How did it come about? Yeah, I think it's a little bit less formal in Australia. I mean, essentially, I didn't know a lot about the roads. And for me, it was searching for a different group of people who could give some interesting advice and perspective. I never dreamed to get a Rhodes and it was really about, can I write a personal statement, figure out where I want to be in 20 years time and speak to people outside medicine who could really kind of provide different perspectives on their pathway. And so it was a complete shock to me. Um, to, to have the opportunity to go over there. I had terrible imposter syndrome <laughs> yeah. and probably still do. <laughs> um, but what I learned in my two years over there was that, you know, we were just exposed to the most amazing group of people who were really driven and passionate about making it a positive impact in the world. And that was really that kind of overarching, um, you know, experience that I saw. Outstanding. 
Now, I was trying to trace where you go went from there because I saw something about being a gymnastics coach. How does that fit in? Yeah, so I, I actually did that through my teenage years. So I was a very avid uh, gymnast, not the best gymnast, but okay. I absolutely loved the sport growing up. And um, and then actually had a really bad accident when I was 12. So um, fractured my neck, wasn't able to really compete in the sport anymore, but absolutely loved it. So continued on coaching. Um, and what I love about gymnastics is, you know, always learning new skills. There's never... It's not just about getting faster. It's always about learning something new, that balance of power and flexibility and mental and physical strength um, and very literally learning how to fall over and over again and do that safely, yeah. which, um, I think, you know, you do literally and then now I do figuratively every day. Yeah, wonderful. So, so then uh, in terms of uh, job-wise before Smiley Scope, what, what, uh, what did you do work-wise? Yeah, so from um, being a gymnastics coach and a pharmacy assistant, I then uh, became a doctor. I trained at a number of different hospitals, including the Royal Children's in Melbourne, um, where I was a paediatric trainee there. Um, and then uh, after the roads, moved to the Boston Consulting Group. Great. Now, I saw that that's, I think, where we, we, didn't, we weren't there at the same time, but one of your board members uh, is one of my classmates, Jim Maritan. He's a good, a good guy, so good job for picking... Uh, picking him now I, I don't want to be offended but you were you were not at boston consulting group for that long so what was uh what was your experience like there and uh, what caused you to move on yeah so i absolutely love my time there and i think um at bcg uh i was with what really surprised me was i was with some really smart people who'd been trained in vastly different ways and so we had incredibly rich debates, perspectives, and, you know, trying to solve problems. You know, you can sort of really see it move from that problem to a very rich and interesting solution. And I absolutely love my time there. What I learnt um, was, firstly, amazing people. Surround yourself with them. Um, surround yourself with smarter people than yourself and people who see different perspectives. Um, and then I learnt going up that learning curve of a different industry um, was something that I could do before I thought in medicine which you just study very deeply um, I wasn't sure if I could do that and that really set me up very much for um, Smiley Scope so I wasn't really looking for a new role with Smiley Scope but during my time at BCG was working with a client who was one of the early players in virtual reality and when I tried on the VR headset I thought wow this could be um, you know, really applicable to healthcare. And I hadn't seen a lot of applications. And so I was fascinated by that. Started working on it in my, my weekends and my, my magic time, we call it at BCG. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, then it just got too big. So it became something that was almost a full-time job. So took a little bit of a leave of absence and sort of thought, look, it's going to be now or never um, that healthcare and virtual reality are really going to become um, an important trend um, you know, BCG will hopefully take me back yeah. uh, if I needed to. So that's kind of where it's been. And I've had an amazing group of BCG supporters, um, you know, and advisors who have continued as we've grown the company. So Evelyn, it sounded like, you know, you had this uh, client experience and you realized there's the aha that VR needs to play in, in healthcare. And of course, you have had a lot of experience in healthcare. What did you see as particularly kind of the uh, unmet need? I mean, other than like a consultant could say, okay, here, VR is playing a big role here, but not, not here. So let's bring it here. But what from your experience, you know, had you seen that said, wow, that would have been great to have, you know, this kind of technology in your practice, for example. Yeah, so what really excited me about virtual reality was how immersive and interactive it was. Instantly, when you try VR on, you can see from a medical healthcare perspective how it could really help with simulation and education. Um, you know, and it already had been used in, you know, practicing for emergency situations for the clinician side, but I thought that the patient side had really been a bit underdone at that point. And so, I could see how powerful it could be for patients to really understand their their disease and condition and how could you then modify that to then make it a more positive experience so they could be better manage their health. That obviously is a really complex thing. Yeah. Um, and it was obviously with every patient being quite different, it is hard to tailor that for each patient. So what we chose to do was say, let's bite off something that's really tangible and is a really consistent um, problem that we see in pediatrics. So that first thing that came to mind was needle procedures. 
Um, every time a child sees yeah. me as a pediatric doctor, they ask, you know, do I need to have a shot or a blood test today? They're just petrified yeah. about one thing. And so it was about how do you reframe that experience and make it a positive one so that it makes it better for the patient so that they're not traumatised, you know, 10 years or 20 years on and don't actually turn up to the doctor? And how do we make it a faster um, and more positive experience for the clinician as well? And so that's really how Smilescope's first idea started was it was a very basic how do we address needle pain and fear. Got it. So I, I saw the video that you have on your on your site that uh, that shows what it's like from the perspective of the uh, of the child. Can you talk through kind of what the technology and offering is? Maybe related to virtual reality that people might be familiar with in their own you know gaming or or other situations they've seen it. Yeah, so I suppose virtual reality, when we think of it from a gaming perspective, is you've got kind of like an Oculus headset, which you put on yourself, you scroll through all these different libraries and you choose a a game or something to do. Um, What we noticed very quickly in healthcare is that obviously, firstly, it needed to be healthcare compatible. It had to be wipeable, easy to use, um, and and something that it didn't mean that the clinician had to put it on first and then give it to the patient. So there were a couple of things that we knew we needed to address with our technology. So we've actually created a really simple touch screen so the clinician can quickly select it rather than having to put on the VR headset themselves. And it takes less than two minutes to really learn how to use it. From the patient perspective, we noticed that, you know, uh, a lot of when you try on an Oculus, they go on a distraction yeah. or teleportation to somewhere else, right? So you go lie on a beach or you go swim with whales or something like that. And in a healthcare environment, when you're doing a procedure, you don't want the patient to be so uh, removed from the procedure that they're surprised and they move their arms right. um, when you're trying to put in that needle. And so what we did was actually create a unique um, patented technique called procedural choreography where we can synchronize what happens in the VR with what's happening in the real world and reframe it. So a very uh, concrete example of that is those fish that come in and nibble in VR when we're putting in the needle. And through that synchronization, it means that the patient can stay still. They're still involved in the procedure, but they can reframe and think about it in a different way. So that's kind of how we're really different in VR. What does it feel like, you know, from the patient perspective to do that. I know I, I have had the experience of taking uh, one of my kids who has uh, chronic illness needed to go to the phlebotomist all the time, which we have here in, uh, in, in Boston. And then I uh, would say that, you know, my child was the only one, you know, after like 20 screaming kids, my, my kid would just sit there and actually look at the arm and just watch it and was fine with it. But um, well, that's not the norm. What What is it like, you know, sort of for different age groups and you know how how does it actually seem is it just sort of distracting them because i remember you know we had a very good pediatrician and he'd lie down and he'd say look at the birdie and he'd flip it around and people would look and he would you know have time to do at least an injection it wasn't necessarily you know placing a an iv or anything like that but what's like what is it really like and how does it how does it change things for that patient yeah so the great thing is for the patient it does look just like a distraction it's really simple and it's intuitive so kids will look around they'll get engaged and excited about it but what on the back end is that we've actually weaved about 24 different best practices in uh, ranging from you know deep breathing and psychological reframing um, all the way through to sort of cbt and all, all these different other practices to really optimize so that you can treat different patients that might be more amenable to certain ways of talking or presenting or or being able to feel pain in different ways so so if you have let's say a a patient that uh goes and experiences this and you know it's much less traumatic and they're not scared away 20 years later and then what happens if they become you know used to that let's just give my child's example where they would go let's say for a month a weekly blood draw and then there may be somewhere else that doesn't have this uh this technology what 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 is it like is it even worse to go and and get that uh, procedure at a place that doesn't have the smiley scope? No, the great thing is, is we've got the technology that's built in that best practice. So the next time you have it, you can then reimagine the fish. You can think about it differently. It doesn't have the same visual immersive, um, you know, 
qualities than as you do in VR, which when you're in that kind of fight and flight response, when you're really scared of a needle, you often do need some additional prompts to yeah. be able to help support. But um, we've had plenty of children who have then reported um, back to us and said, look, we didn't have a smoscope this time, but we still had a fantastic experience and we were able to use those skills to, to have a, um, a better healthcare experience. So, you know, I think with any uh, business, when you're getting it started, you need to be focused, even if there's this great platform opportunity and it goes beyond that. So the needle thing, I think, is pretty, pretty clear and also is pretty widespread. So it's a it's a it's a niche in a sense, but it's widespread. Everybody has that in their experience and could be the gateway to to a lot more, because if you if you're not if you're scared away from the doctor's office and you don't go for that, you don't have whatever else is needed as well. But what what do you see going, uh, you know, beyond the needle procedures and what's, you know, where are you as a company? That was a really exciting thing was once we did our clinical trial and we were um, taking the equipment away, we the emergency department physicians were saying, hang on, can you keep it here? We're happy to pay for it. We've been actually borrowing the device and using it for all sorts of other things. So <laughs> They were using it for suturing wounds and dressing changes and, um, you know, supporting children when they were doing plaster casts, putting them on and off, um, x-rays, a really wide range of procedures that were painful or anxiety provoking. And so we started working on how do we develop specific use cases um, and expand that um, both in terms of the procedures in the hospital that are done um, and also the age groups. So now we do we have over 25 different VR experiences and we cover from you know children as young as three or four all the way through to adulthood. Great. Okay. And so where uh, where is this deployed? How you know to what extent have you gotten beyond the clinical trials or is it still in the trial stage? Yeah, so we're now commercial. We've been uh, working on the sort of commercial launch for about 18 months uh, in Australia and we're in 100% of Australian children's hospitals and about 60 to 80 uh, hospitals around Australia. Um, and in the US, we launched probably at the turn of this year um, and we're working with about 20 of the top 30 children's hospitals in the US. Great. So, you know, as I think about... Uh, what's happened in during the uh, the global health uh, emergency with just the overall level of anxiety uh, that's out there, not even if it's not connected even to a needle procedure, but just compared to just waking up and thinking about what's going in the world or walking down the street. Does a smiley scope or your kind of associated technology have any role beyond sort of like a specific procedure with a needle or some other kind of, uh, you know, something that could be traumatic on its, on its own? Is, is there a broader application? Because you mentioned CBT, for example. Yeah, there certainly is with the technology. Um, so on our platform, we do have a number of meditations and relaxing experiences as well that we've built in um, pretty much from demand from clinicians themselves who will use it on their coffee breaks because yeah. it has been a very stressful uh, time during the pandemic um, and also long-stay patients and palliative care patients. So we have done that to expand out a bit more broadly. And are those long stay and palliative care patients, are those adult populations or are, you, or are you talking about pediatric as well? It's been both. Yeah. So what have you, um, you know, what have you learned by you know, coming from uh, the Australian market where it sounds like you're pretty well penetrated and then taking a, a pretty well trod, you know, course going from Australia, which is a big country, but a small population to, uh, you know, to the U.S., which is a, which is a huge market. What what are the things that you sort of expected and what are the things that you didn't expect but uh, found out anyway or still finding out? Yeah, I think the, the fundamental thing is, is that pain and anxiety is a universal uh, need that needs to be addressed. And so around the world, you know, patients are still scared of needles. Clinicians still need some great solutions to be able to help alleviate pain and um, particularly procedural care. Um in terms of some of the new things that we learned, I think that one of the big things is that there is much more specialization in the US healthcare yeah. clinical workforce. And so, you know, as a pediatrician in Australia, I've done a lot of the procedures myself and have high familiarity with those. But what we found was in the US, you know, your pediatrician who's making the medical decisions has may not have done many procedures before. Um, because there's someone like a physician assistant or nurse um, who does those 
procedures themselves. And so that has been a little bit of a trying, you know, you've got an extra person or extra stakeholder to bring into the picture. And there are sort of also further um, specialties like child life specialists who are more prevalent in the US as well. So I think it's about navigating a more complex stakeholder management plan to be able to find uh, the way to secure contracts within hospitals. Um, But at the end of the day, you know, we still have the same really positive responses from patients and clinicians. Well, I won't put words in your mouth, but uh, I know the child life specialist one always throws people off when they get to the U.S. And I'll just say not necessarily for Smiley Scope, but for some other innovations, um, the child life specialist can actually feel threatened because it is an extra sort of layer of, of support for pediatric patients. And they say, well, wait a minute, uh, you know, this is what I'm doing already with my, my techniques. Um, so I don't know if you've had that experience, but I've seen it with um, hospital uh, clowning, for example, uh, which they don't have child life specialists outside of the U.S., but uh, here, uh, here we do. Yeah, that's right. Talk about the business model a little bit. So, and this sounds great, you know, and as a, uh, as a patient or the parent of a patient, I could, I could well imagine uh, that it would be a positive. It might get me to go to one, you know, hospital over, over another, but, you know, beyond that, what, who's paying you, what's their basis to be able to uh, pay you? How does it, how does it all work together? Yeah, so with our business model, there are really two prongs to it. The first that we're currently going through is a subscription-based model. So SmileScope is purchased by the provider as a license um, and they can use SmileScope's hardware and software as many times as they'd like on any patient and procedure. And that's a great thing is we're really driving adoption um, and being that first line of care for procedural pain management. Secondly, we're really starting to build in some reimbursement. So there's been a strong push for digital therapeutics and being able to offer sort of drug-free therapies as first line where possible, safe and effective. And so we're starting to see reimbursement for these types of technologies um, and increasing appetite from payers and providers. So that's kind of the second part of our business model. We'll then be able to, um, you know, work on reimbursement as well. So you would be able to position yourself as a digital therapeutic, it sounds like. That's right. That's the plan. Yeah. Now, it's interesting because I, sometimes I, I look at digital therapeutics that might be a substitute for a uh, conventional pharmaceutical product and you say, yeah, the concept is the same, but like, is that really something that, you know, should be reimbursed and can really compete or is it really just, just one flavor of CBT wrapped in another um, box? But I can see here where you're actually doing, it's a, it's a complement to a procedure. You could almost say it's analogous to like an anti-emetic in a surgery where, you know, someone's going to have nausea as part of uh, the procedure. And so you'd administer something with that. And this could be something uh, analogous, but is that the right way to look at it? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. What we see from a lot of clinicians is they say, look, now that we offer SmileScope as first line um, a therapy, we're actually finding that we're not having to sedate patients as often. We're not needing to give gas anesthetic or opioids um, as often. And so that's a really powerful thing um, when you kind of accumulate that through uh, the hospital and and all the departments and cases that we see. So I think that digital anesthetic concept is really interesting um, and something that we're building on. So related area, you know, that people are fearful of, but I don't know how it would would work with your your approach is uh, dentistry. Uh, is that an area that you uh, participate in or look at? It's certainly one that comes up quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no one likes going to the dentist. So it's uh, something we've tested a little bit. Um, it's still early days for us, yeah. but we've been working with the um, Special Olympics dental and medical checks uh, in Texas. And so there have been some really positive results there Um we would have to modify some of our technologies to make sure the patient was really still yeah. for that. Um, but yeah, it's certainly a possibility. Yeah, good. What else is on the roadmap that you uh, might be able to talk about? If you, if you look out ahead three or five years, I'm not sure what the, what the time frame is. How, how would you see SmileyScope evolving? Yeah, I can see SmileyScope as a digital therapeutic that's really pioneering that, um, you know, balance between, you know, do we need to sedate a patient or can we um, avoid that, Uh, which is incredibly exciting. And what we're seeing is really clinicians are taking this movement and and running with it in very different ways. Um, So some examples would be that we've got an OBGYN clinical trial started up in IUD insertion 
um, and in other painful procedures in the gynae space. And uh, in reproductive health, we've got uh, just kicked off a clinical trial for vasectomy pain management as well. So there's some really interesting ways that we're going to be able to broaden Smyoscope's application in the adult procedural space. And then, as you've kind of alluded to, chronic pain and other areas yeah. um, are also really important and on our radar and our patented technology could be really powerful. Great. Um, and what have you done for fundraising? So we're currently uh, finalizing our um, seed prime round. And so uh, that's a 7 million round and about 60% will go towards sales and marketing and expansion in the US. And um, the remainder will go towards uh, regulatory reimbursement and expansion into adults. Yeah. Okay. Well, it sounds great. And it sounds like you've made great progress to still be at the seed stage from a financing standpoint. So congratulations uh, on that. I want to just you. ask yeah. you uh, a last question about whether with all that you're, that you're doing here, have you had a chance to read any, uh, any books and is there uh, anything that you would recommend to our viewers and listeners? Yeah, so I suppose on the technology side, I've been reading Neuromancer. Um, William Gibson uh, was written in 1984, but it has some really startling, accurate yeah. predictions of, yeah, hacking and cybersecurity and VR and AI. It's, it's fascinating. Um, many of the areas of technology that we're grappling with today. So I'd recommend that. And uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Great. Sounds good. All right. Well, those are both good books. So I thought Thinking Fast and Slow is recommended by a recent guest, and I've, I've read that one. Uh, Neuromancer, I've heard of, and I, I didn't read it uh, in 1984 when it came out, but uh, I'll have to uh, put it on my list and pick it up a little bit later. Well, Dr. Evelyn Chan, uh, CEO of Smiley Scope, I want to say thank you so much for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast. Great. Thanks so much for having me, David. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.